Well, welcome. Welcome to the uh, seventh week in the book of Galatians. Yes, count them, seven, only one more to go. It's been a long journey. And just as a reminder, all these sessions can be viewed on demand at Hometown's YouTube page. Freedom! That was the last cry of William Wallace just before he died in Braveheart. Freedom! Why don't you cry it out with me? All together now, freedom! Well, Paul, he says it like this in Galatians 5, verse 1. So Christ has surely, truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in the slavery to the law. So how do we, how do we describe our freedom? And how do we know when we get tied up again in slavery to the law? This is one of the great challenges of understanding the book of Galatians and, and even teaching Galatians. Because there's a, an historical context that makes the Galatian problem just seem distant and not applicable, especially to us modern American Christians. You know, those early believers were being influenced by Judaizers who insisted that they not only believe in Jesus, but also obeyed the law of Moses. But we're not being influenced that way. I mean, not many of us are contemplating being circumcised. We're not thinking about obeying the law of Moses. So how does Galatians apply to us? Well, we're going to get into that in just a moment. But I first, I want you to notice the background. This is another tour I'm giving you of the, my home state of Oregon. Uh, another meaningful view to me. I'm, uh, where this photo was taken, I was standing in a lava field uh, looking south. The uh, larger mountain that you see there in the northern Cascades is the North Sister. And the smaller, slightly smaller one is the uh, Middle Sister. Uh, and actually behind that is the South Sister, which they call the Three Sisters in the Northern Cascades in Oregon. Now, why this is meaningful to me is because the Middle Sister there is a mountain that I climbed when I was about 10 years old with uh, my dad and a few relatives. It was an overnight trip, and uh, we, uh, we uh, slept on near a cliff and then finished climbing the mountain the next day. So plenty of memories for me there. I'm going to uh, I'm going to share a screen here, which um, I guess I'm already doing, and I want you to see this review of Galatians here. And for the sake of review, the uh, Galatian the Book of Galatians reveals two basic ways to God. One of them is right and the other is wrong. So there's two ways to God. First way is legalism or the way of religion. It basically says, I obey, therefore I'm accepted by God. Number two, second way is the good news or the gospel. And that basically says, I'm accepted by God through Jesus Christ, therefore I obey. Now we've reviewed this, we've gone over this, but the good news is all about the acceptance of God given to us as a free gift. We are declared innocent when we placed our faith in Christ. And therefore, because we've been declared innocent, our holy God accepts us. We're justified, that's the term, being declared innocent. And it's given to us as a free gift, completely apart from our merit or effort. And if we get it deep in our heart, that free justification and allow it to seep into our hearts, then our hearts are restructured and filled with gratitude and worship, and we're drawn to God, and we want to obey him. But legalism that says, I obey, therefore I'm accepted by God, is just the opposite. This is the way we attempt to prove ourselves by our effort and by our obedience. And we go down that path where suddenly we're enslaved because we never know if we've done enough. For the Galatians, they plugged in the law as a way to prove themselves. For us, we can plug in anything, a whole variety of things, in order to try to prove ourselves to God. 
And I, frankly, as a teacher, have been kind of looking for ways to explain what it means to be free. So I'm going to stop the share here. And uh, I want you to try this on for size. Have you ever been in a relationship where it's performance driven, where you need to put out, where you needed to respond and behave correctly, or the person will get upset, or you get a cold shoulder, or they get angry because they're just so touchy. And as a result, you had to walk very carefully, didn't you? Like on eggshells. There's no freedom in that relationship, right? You had to be very careful about what you did or didn't do because you were not free to be yourself. You were guarded. You were uptight. And because you had to be careful about your performance and what you were doing and not doing, you had this magnifying glass on yourself, evaluating everything you were doing so you would not upset the other person. Some of you were brought up in households like that. If mama ain't happy, then no one's happy. Or if you don't behave correctly, then, then dad just snaps. Maybe you're even in a relationship that's like that now. And frankly, it's prison. It's slavery. On the other hand, freedom in relationships happen when you don't have to worry anymore about doing something just right or afraid of doing something wrong, worried about how a person might react. You know, freedom in relationships means there's no more need to perform, no more need to put on your best self. They can just be yourself and relax. Freedom in relationships means there's acceptance and appreciation. Sins and offenses and irritations are just absorbed and forgotten. And there's this mutual joy and appreciation. And that, when you're in a relationship like that, is tremendous relief and it's freedom. And that's how it is with God. At least that's how he is towards you. And we need to receive that and believe that and walk in freedom. If you uh, viewed or attended Hometown's uh, Sunday service yesterday, uh, Spencer began the book of Philippians and he shared an emotional principle. And the principle is, is that joy comes from getting eyes off yourself. Yes, get your eyes on others. We know that, that that's an intuitively true, that the more that we think about ourselves, the more discouraged we get. But you know, Galatians reveals something even deeper. Walking by the law is the deepest expression of having your eyes on yourself. Because you have to be so careful about your performance and what you're doing and not doing. So you have this magnifying glass on yourself, evaluating everything that you're doing. And that's the epitome of being self-absorbed. Another way to put it means walking by the law means you have placed yourself under a measuring stick. Think of that metaphor. You're constantly evaluating yourself whether or not you did well or not. What's the result of that? It's self-absorption. And that's the opposite of what it's like walking in the truth of the gospel, the free gift of justification, which means you're free to get your eyes off yourself. And you move towards gratefulness and worship, which means your eyes are on God rather than yourself. Then you are free to love, to love God and to love others. This is why Paul was so upset at the Judaizers who came into the Galatian churches. They introduced to the church a performance orientation to God. And the Galatians were now becoming self-absorbed rather than Jesus-absorbed. Remember how he said it in chapter 4, verse 5? He said, where is that joy and grateful spirit you felt then? It was gone. It was slipping through the floorboards. So no wonder Paul was a little peeved. So why don't you turn in your Bibles to Galatians 5, verse 7, and we'll pick up where we left off last week. He says this, You were running the race so well. Who has held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God, for he is the one who called you to freedom. This false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. I'm trusting the Lord to keep you from believing false teachers. God will judge that person, whoever he is, 
who's been confusing you. Dear brothers and sisters, if I were still preaching that, you must be circum that you must be circumcised, as some say I do, why am I still being persecuted? If I were no longer preaching salvation through the cross of Christ, no one would be offended. I just wish that those troublemakers who want to mutilate, mutilate you by circumcision would mutilate themselves. Well, Paul admits that they started well, but the false teachers filtered in right after Paul left. And once this kind of performance thinking gets started, it's like yeast, it spreads. So why is it so attractive? Well, since we're so used to conditional relationships, it just makes sense to apply that thinking to God. And there's something about our sinful nature that just likes to be measured and on a performance system. We, we like measuring sticks so we can measure ourselves, then we can rate other people too, and then we can compare ourselves to others. You know, this kind of thing happens with any group of people, fraternities and clubs and many other types of social groups. You know, gangs in the city have their rules and their ways of looking. In high school, there's the skater group, the goth group, the hip hop group, the polo shirt group, other kinds of gangs. You know, they have their own look, their own unique set of rules in order to belong. You know, adults do the same thing. You know, there's the Harley crowd, the country club crowd, the artsy crowd, even a political crowd. And it affects your dress, your language, your behavior. After all, we all want to have a sense of identity and belonging. And if this is apart from Jesus, we find it in social rules that makes us part of one group that sets us up against other people even happens to churches because we're social creatures. So churches have unspoken rules that measure others that kind of say subtly, this is what you need to look like. This is what you need to believe and act like. Then you'll fit in. It's not written down, just part of the culture. Could be how you dress. I mean, think of an extreme example like the Amish. They all look a certain way. The car you drive. Certain Christian circles say you got to be driving a used car and make it old. How you educate your children. Some are into homeschooling and some are into public schooling. Some are in between and some make that part of the identity of the group you're with. Then there's don't ever, don't ever wear tattoos and no music with a loud big beat, no rap. Make sure you always have a quiet time in the morning for at least 30 minutes. No beer. At least no light beer. It's got to be craft beer. Anyway, those are the different ways that things can affect a church. So these Judaizers, they, they come to town, to Galatia, and they say, well, Jesus is fine, but look at us. We're special. Look at how spiritual we are because we go all out and obey the law. We're committed. After all, God gave the Israelites the law, so the law is spiritual special and shouldn't be ignored, should it? I mean, if you wonder what true spirituality looks like, then it would be someone who's obeying the law and super committed like us. We're circumcised. Now, if you were a Gentile man, adult man listening to that, you'd think, well, that is pretty dedicated. And they're saying, we fast, we observe the Sabbath. Wow, was that dedicated? I mean, going without food and refraining from work for a whole day and just seeking God. Boy, that's a definition of commitment, isn't it? And frankly, there's something really attractive about that because we all want to be committed too, right? Makes you feel secure because you have something real tangible to follow. And, you know, listen, maybe this past week you had a tough time with your wife. And then you say to yourself, well, at least I'm observing the Sabbath and I got circumcised. Now, if she could just be as spiritual as me. Or maybe you found your, last week your husband really irritating you. And you say, well, at least I go to church every week and I read my Bible every day. I wish he could be just as spiritual as me. See what I'm getting at? You could be following the rules. But maybe there's no fruit of the Spirit which was exactly where these churches were going. 
And it's like yeast, because in a sense, following rules to measure yourself is easier and is less humbling. So Paul mentions in the verses that we just read about persecution. So where does the persecution come from? He says, dear brothers and sisters, if I were still preaching that you must be circumcised, as some say I do, why am I still being persecuted? If I were no longer preaching salvation through the cross of Christ, no one would be offended. I just wish those troublemakers who want to mutilate you by circumcision would mutilate themselves. Well, the cross brings an offense. Why do people get upset at the cross? Because if you understand the cross as you're supposed to, the cross means, number one, I'm helpless. I sin. I deserve hell. And two, God did it all to save me, and I did nothing. Both of those things cuts deeply at pride. That means... There's nothing I can do to stand out from the crowd and be better than others. People don't like the cross, not necessarily because it's the only way. People don't like the cross because the message is one of total humility and total dependence. Verse 12, Paul says, I just wish that those troublemakers who want to mutilate you by circumcision would mutilate themselves. Well, here's Paul's logic there. He says, once you start down the path of the law, you guys, why don't you just go the whole way? If you want to show how dedicated you are, then go the whole way. If cutting away a little piece of the flesh through circumcision, if that seems spiritual and dedicated, why don't you go farther? I mean, how much more spiritual and dedicated would it be if you cut the whole thing off? Now, I'm not going to tell you what the whole thing is. You can guess. That's why he's refuting, referring to mutilation. Next verse, verse 13. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. Now here, Paul begins to address the danger of freedom, and there is a danger. We're called to live in freedom. We're free from guilt. We're free from an accusing conscience. We're free from condemnation. We're free from the need to perform. We're free from fear. We're free from having to perform to get God's acceptance. But this naturally leads to a question that Paul had to deal with over and over and over in the epistles, and the question is, well, Paul, if that's what freedom means, then why can't I just go out and sin a lot? Why not explore my freedoms? Why not indulge myself? Why not drink a little too much? Why not get buzzed? I mean, wasn't wine given to glad man's heart? I mean, why not watch titillating images on the internet over and over? Why not get argumentative on Facebook? Why not watch way too much TV, staying up way too late? Why not, why not skip church and just fish a lot? After all, I mean, I can worship God out in nature. Am I not free to do that? Why not eat too much for pleasure and then just top it all off with chocolate? Why not go back to the buffet line for the third time? Why not buy that, ma that nice car with heated leather seats and all the whistles and bells and and then give less for kingdom builders. Am I not free? Paul says, yeah, you're free. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Use your freedom to love and serve others. The real test of Christian maturity is not how much liberty one exhibits, but rather how much love one exhibits. Let me say that again. The real test of Christian maturity is not how much liberty one exhibits, but rather how much love one exhibits. Sometimes for Christians, the pendulum swings too far this way, and we say to ourselves, I want to prove to the world that I'm not a legalist. I'm not going to be bound up with rules. I'm going to break free. And a lot of teenagers and young adults do this who have been brought up in Christian households. 
but it's pride. They just expressed in a different way. It's pride that says, look at me, look how free I am. Look at how I'm busting people's expectations of me. I'm breaking the rules. I'm breaking the social mores of my church. I'm my own man. I'm my own woman. Look at me. I'm special and free. I don't even feel the need to go to church. It's kind of like being a religious hippie. Christian freedom is freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. Christian freedom leads to becoming involved with people rather than separating from people. Use your freedom to serve and love. And in this time of pandemic, how much initiative are you taking with people? There are all kinds of ways to love and serve people while still being six foot away and with a mask on. It says, for the whole law can be subbed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, the amazing thing about love is that it takes the place of all the laws God ever gave. Love your neighbor solves every problem in human relations. If you love people, you're not going to steal from them. You're not going to lie to them. You're not going to envy them or try to hurt them in any way. That about sums up the old Ten Commandments. Love in the heart is God's substitute for laws and the threat of punishment. Love in the heart is God's substitute for laws and the threat of punishment. Verse 15. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. This is what happens to relationships when you slip from inner freedom. You begin to pick one another apart. A little bite here, little bite there, little picks, little digs, until another person is devoured and destroyed. You know you can't kill someone with a thousand little cuts. Now we're going to move on to talk about the spirit. Oh, the mysterious spirit. But not so mysterious as we'll soon see. There are free phrases in this next passage that tell us how really to interact with the spirit. And the best way to see these phrases is by using the English Standard Version, which is probably the closest English version to the Greek. Verse 16, the NLT says, let the spirit guide your lives. But the ESV says, walk by the spirit. Verse 18, the NLT says, be directed by the spirit. But the ESV says, led by the spirit. Verse 25, it says, the NLT says, follow the spirit's leading. But the ESV says, keep in step with the spirit. So it's walk by the spirit, led by the spirit, keep in step with the spirit. So let's start in verse 16, where it says, walk by the spirit. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives or walk by the spirit. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you're directed by the spirit, you're not under obligation to the law of Moses. So let's be careful that we're not proof texting this. What's that mean? Proof texting means you're using the Bible to say something that the Bible isn't saying. This passage is not teaching that the Holy Spirit is putting things into our minds and we're to follow those promptings. Now, the Holy Spirit may be doing that, might do that, but this is not what this passage is talking about. Keep in mind that the context of the whole letter is that Paul is talking about, as Paul is beginning to talk about the Holy Spirit, is that he's contrasting freedom living and law living. Now he's saying walk by the Spirit. Walking by the Spirit is walking in freedom, and walking in freedom is walking by the Spirit. It's the same thing. In other words, Understanding your freedom is the key to being filled with the Spirit. Once you start reverting back to walking by the law 
or under the law, trying to earn God's approval in all the subtle ways that we do it, then you begin to do what your sinful nature craves, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And you begin to do things your sinful flesh desires. Now, we already saw that visibly with the Galatians in Galatians chapter 4. I mean, if you remember, it said that one time they had this joyful and grateful spirit and they loved Paul so that they were willing to even give their eyes to him. So we see love there. We see joy there. We see self-sacrificialness there, the fruits of the spirit. And then Paul says something began to sour. They began walking under the law. And the relationship with Paul began to deteriorate. And it even began to deteriorate among themselves. They were biting and devouring one another. That's the fruit of the flesh, fruit of the sinful nature. It says that here that these two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you're not free to carry out your good intentions. Well, what two, what two forces? Well, yes, we have a sinful nature that's warring inside of us. And yes, we're in a spiritual battle and we forcibly feel temptation and we feel that battle in the inside. All that's true. But there is in even an underlying battle, just like there was a battle. Remember the battle in, uh, in the allegory of Galatians 4 where Hagar and Ishmael were in the same household as Sarah and Isaac and there was a battle. So there's this battle between freedom and legalism. The spirit is leading one way, and your sinful nature is leading another way. So sometimes you're unable to carry out your good intentions, but we must get rid of the slave and her son when we find it in our own lives. We can tell that Paul is getting at this deeper battle with legalism versus freedom with this next phrase. But when you're directed by the spirit, you're not under obligation to the law of Moses. Now, that's the second big phrase in the ESV, led by the Spirit. When you're led by the Spirit, you're not under law. Notice that contrast. Led by the Spirit is contrasted with living under the law or living under obligation to the law. You're either under the direction of the Spirit or you're under the law. The Spirit helps us. See the person and the work of Jesus and how he offers us free innocence as a gift. The Spirit is revealing that to us. The Spirit helps us see that we're not under the law. We're not under a merit system with God. And being led by the Spirit results in freedom, not under obligation. Next verse, verse 19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envying, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I said before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. So when you are walking by the law and under the law, these acts can occur all the way from sexual issues, to spiritual issues, to a relational fallout, when he says hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy. There's uh, addictions mentioned there. But when you walk by the Spirit, when you're led by the Spirit, then you're not under the obligation of the law. And then verse 20, verse 22 happens. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified him there. Since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. It's great stuff there. Notice the impact on our emotions and on our relationships. What would our lives be like if we lived that way? It'd be great. But how? 
That's the $20,000 question. Who wouldn't want a life like that? So you, do you know what people do? They make a plan. I need to be serious about change. I need to go from point A to point B. I need to make a plan. So we make plans. We say, well, I need to be disciplined. I, I need to do this. I need to do that. This time I'm really serious. I'm going to make big time New Year's resolutions. Vows. I'm going to change. Some of us come up with our own plans. Other of us find a church, a pastor, a leader, a book, Oprah, Dr. Phil, to make plans for us. The Judaizers had a plan. They had a pretty good picture of what spirituality looked like. Follow the law. The problem is this appeals to the pride of our sinful nature. We've talked about it. It's like, look at what I can do. Now, pride is the very issue that casts Satan out of heaven. Now, is that progress? Living under the law pumps up our sinful nature because it pumps up our pride. So what's the answer? It's wrapped up in those three phrases. Live by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. In verse 25, keep in step with the Spirit. Follow the Spirit's leading. Keep in step with the Spirit. Follow, keep in step of the Spirit is the same idea of walk by the Spirit, but it's a little stronger. It literally is a Greek word that references a soldier marching. It means to walk in a row as the march of a soldier. It means to walk in line with the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit. Keeping in step with the Spirit means to keep in step with the freedom that we have in Christ, because the Spirit is all about revealing Jesus. The Spirit is all about showing us to live in freedom. So let's get in step. Again, again, keep in mind that the whole book of Galatians, Paul is trying to contrast two ways to live. Living under the law, which is what? It's a focus on your performance, which leads to what? Slavery, which leads to what? Pride, or the flip side of that is discouragement, which leads to selfish motivations, you know, going in two different ways, you know. I don't remember, do you remember the tale of two hearts where that, where the uh, landowner said, I was going to give something to my king because he was trying to get something from him. Living under law leads being self-absorbed. We talked about that earlier. And that leads to the fruits of the flesh. It leads to relational tension. But living under grace is what? It's a focus on the performance of Jesus. Not our own performance, but the performance of Jesus, which leads to freedom. And that leads to worship and delight and joy because you're focused on Jesus, not yourself. And that leads to proper motivation where you're pleasing God, not trying to appease him. And it leads to being filled with the fruits of the Spirit because it, it restructures our motivation. And it leads us to seek Jesus and we're attracted to him. So to live by the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit, bottom line means to focus on Jesus, to focus on the good news of the gospel, to focus on his performance and not slip back to concern about our own performance. You know, our goal as Christians is not to stay away from sin. Our goal is not to try hard to be moral. Our goal is to worship Jesus, to love Jesus, and to be close to him. Then the fruit of the Spirit comes as a byproduct. This is why the metaphor in John 15 is very important here. You know, you cannot talk about the fruit of the Spirit without talking about the metaphor of the vine and the branches and the fruit. Remember that story, that little parable, that metaphor that Jesus shares? He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who remains or abides, who remains fixed in me, bears fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. How does fruit come? Fruit comes from a life-giving, nourishing connection with Jesus. 
I've got to be honest with you, I've been kind of frustrated in the past with the writings of, of Paul on the Spirit here in Galatians and then in, in Ephesians and a couple other places. And I ask myself, why isn't Paul more explicit here? Why doesn't he tell us five easy steps to be filled with the Spirit? Why doesn't he tell us something practical to do? Well, you know, you can't formulize relationships. I mean, let, let's take marriage, for instance. Is there five steps to a great marriage? How, how do you reduce a great relationship down to five easy steps? I mean, you can't. Let's just think this out, though, for a moment. Let's just say one step is, well, do a date night with their spouse once a week. Well, then you would think, well, all I need to do is to go out with my spouse once a week. But we know a great relationship is more than that. It's more than simply being in the same room and having time together. I mean, well, golly, haven't you been to restaurants and seen couples who are having their date night, but you can just tell their hearts aren't there. They're hardly talking. Maybe the guy is thinking, well, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm, I'm here. But he's not really being loving. He's appeasing his wife, not pleasing her. The same way we can't boil down a relationship with God into five easy steps. Now, the, the, the Spirit may lead you to do spiritual disciplines and other things. I mean, just like a, any loving marriage, uh, you know, you, it might be really good to go out on a date night because a relationship requires talking and time and listening. But there's just something different about the approach. It isn't about appeasing someone. Do you get it? It's the difference between duty and delight. So let's get in step with the Spirit. Let's walk by the Spirit. Let's be led by the Spirit and delight in Jesus. Because he delighted in us. And he died on the cross so we wouldn't have to perform anymore. Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, uh, we're so grateful for your performance, and that's what we want to focus on, so that our hearts are filled with joy and gratitude uh, because you have declared us innocent. And we just ask, even by the help of the Holy Spirit, uh, that you'd make all this come alive, that we'd see the beauty of Jesus, we'd see more and more what he's done for us, and that would filter down into our life. Help us to live by the Spirit, help us to uh, walk by the Spirit, help us to keep in step with the Spirit. And we commit this to you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We all thank you for um, uh, being with me here tonight again. And it's uh, very nice to be with you. Uh, hope that you have a great evening and uh, uh, have a good night. Thanks. Bye-bye.